Thank you, Handbell Choir. Good morning. Good morning. We welcome you to our worship on this sixth Sunday in the season of Easter. It is great to have all of you with us this day. As always, a very special welcome to those who are joining us via our YouTube channel. And a very special welcome to our graduating high school seniors who are with us this day. We began with a call to worship. If you are able, I invite you to please rise. Gracious God, in love you have created us. In love you have made us your people. In love you have come among us in Christ, healing and forgiving. You give us life and fill us with your love. Let us sing together our gathering hymn. We continue with the greeting. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray. Bountiful God,
You may be seated. The first reading is from the book of, of Acts, the 16th chapter. During the night, Paul had a vision. There stood a man of Macedonia pleading with him and saying, Come over to Macedonia and help us. When he had seen the vision, we immediately tried to cross over to Macedonia, being convinced that God had called us to proclaim the good news to them. We set sail from Troas and took a straight course to Samothrace, the following day to Neapolis, and from there to Philippi, which is a leading city of the district of Macedonia and a Roman colony. We remained in this city for some days. On the Sabbath day, we went outside the gate by the river, where we supposed there was a place of prayer, and we sat down and we spoke to the women who had gathered there. A certain woman named Lydia, a worshiper of God, was listening to us. She was uh, from the city of Tyra, and a dealer in purple cloth. The Lord opened her heart to listen eagerly to what was said by Paul. When she and her household were baptized, she urged us, saying, If you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come and stay at my home. And she prevailed upon us. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. We'll read Psalm 67 responsively. May God be merciful to us and bless us. May the light of God shine, face shine upon us. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. May God give us blessing, and may all the ends of the earth stand in awe. The second reading is from the book of Revelations, the 21st and 22nd chapters. And in the spirit, one of the angels carried me away to a great high mountain and showed me the holy city Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God. I saw no temple in the city, for its temple is the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb. And the city has no need of sun or moon to shine on it, for the glory of God is its light, and its lamp is the Lamb. The nations will walk by its light, and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it. Its gates will never be shut by day, and there will be no light there, no night there. People will bring into, the, into it the glory and the honor of the nations, but nothing unclean will enter it, nor anyone who practices abomination or falsehood, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb through the middle of the street of the city. On the other side of the river is the tree of life with its 12 kinds of fruit, producing its fruit each month, and the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. Nothing accursed will be found there anymore, but the throne of God and the Lamb will be in it, and his servants will worship him. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads. And there will be no more night. They need no light of lamp or sun, for the Lord God will be their light, and they will reign forever and ever. Word of God, word of life. Holy Gospel according to John, the 14th chapter. Glory to you, Lord. Jesus answered, Those who love me will keep my words, and my Father will love them, and we will come to them and make our home with them. 
Whoever does not love me does not keep my words. And the word that you hear is not mine, but it is from the Father who sent me. I have said these things to you while I am still with you. But the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you everything and remind you of all that I have said to you. Peace I leave with you. Peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled, and do not let them be afraid. You heard me say to you, I am going away, and I am coming to you. If you loved me, you would rejoice that I am going to the Father, because the Father is greater than I. And now I have told you this before it occurs, so that when it does occur, you may believe. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Please be seated. Well, as someone who likes to travel, I have always admired the Apostle Paul for his adventurous spirit. He never seemed to pass up a trip. And during his time, he took three major trips to most of the known cities or the major cities in the Western world at that time. He went to some of those places that we had never heard of, and Brian had so much fun trying to pronounce as every reader on this day does, because it's the only time we ever see those words of those cities is on a day like today. But nevertheless, Paul went there. And of course, travel in his day was a little bit more complicated than it is in our day. He wasn't able to go on the internet and line up all of his Marriott so that they corresponded to where he might be that night, making sure there was a mint on the pillow when he arrived. And of course, he wasn't able to book his flight and get a seat by the aisle or by the window, whichever you prefer, and making sure you had a little extra leg room so the trip would not be quite so arduous. No, when the Apostle Paul traveled, it was difficult and risky business. As we know from the book of Acts, many times he was shipwrecked, sometimes thrown in prison, other times the sea was so rough He never thought that he would ever make it to his destination. But yet again and again, when the word of the Lord came to him to go to this place or to that place, Paul never seemed to hesitate. He just packed his bags and away he went. Now that's different than some of the other people we read about in the Bible. As we know in the Old Testament, there were some prophets, both major prophets and minor prophets, that were not always so eager to go where it was the Lord was calling them. We know that when Jonah was called by the Lord to go this way, he decided he would go in the exact opposite direction. And Elijah and Elijah were not always so keen to go and speak the word of the Lord. But nevertheless, Paul always went. Maybe it was because after his life underwent such a radical change, and he did a 180, and instead of going in this direction, he went in the absolute opposite direction. He was a little bit more flexible or open to where the Spirit was calling him. And I think that is a very admirable trait, to be open to where the Spirit is calling us, open to new adventures wherever it is that God might be leading us. And so a few weeks ago, I heard about a person by the name of Chris Ingram. Perhaps you have heard of him too. Chris Ingram is a reporter for the Washington Post, and he describes himself as a data person. And as a data person, I take it to mean that he analyzes all kinds of numbers and statistics in order to arrive at certain conclusions. I have to admit that sometimes I am more inclined to agree with Mark Twain when it comes to statistics. As you know, Twain famously said, there are three kinds of lies. There's a lie, there's a darn lie, and then there's statistics. But be that as it may, Chris would analyze statistics and come up with what was best and what was worst. And so a number of years ago, he put all his statistics together and decided that the worst place to live in America was Red Lake County, Minnesota, which is in the northwestern section of Minnesota. 
Now, I have passed through Red Lake County, and while I can't say it was particularly memorable, I don't know that I would describe it as the worst place to live. But that's what Chris's data showed him, and so you can well imagine that the nice people from Minnesota, when they heard this news, especially the ones from Red Lake County, were not necessarily so nice about receiving this news. He said that he got a number of emails, which I'm sure he often does. Some were, of course, a little less kind than others, but others simply said, Chris, how can you say this is the worst place to live when you've never been here? And so the mayor and I think a few other people invited him to come to Red Lake County so he could see for himself. And of course, he said to his wife, why would I ever go to Red Lake County now? I'll be tired and feathered and run out of town. But after a number of exchanges back and forth, he finally decided that he would go to Red Lake County. And they rolled out the red carpet for him, or as much as they can do in northern Minnesota. They had a marching band that played when he arrived. They showed him around and showed him to what they felt were the best places in that area and generally gave him a very warm welcome. Well, he flew back to his home in Baltimore and said, you know, it wasn't such a bad place after all. And about that same time, Chris and his wife, who had a couple of young children, I think they were expecting another, were looking to make a change because living in Baltimore, he would commute into his place of work, and he said it was about an hour and 20, hour and 30 minutes each way, which meant that he would get up in the morning before his children were awake and come home at night after his children were asleep. He wouldn't see them hardly at all on the weekdays, only sometimes on Saturday and Sunday. And after a while, he decided, you know, this is just no way to live. And it was about that time that his mother said, well, maybe you should move to Red Lake, Minnesota. <laughs> and to make a long story short, that's exactly what he did. He moved to Red Lake, Minnesota, and three years later, he said, it's a great place to live. He works remotely. He's able to go online, attend Zoom meetings, hand everything in via the Internet. But he said what he loves about the place is that he will have these meetings, and then afterwards he can walk outside, and he's in the beautiful rural countryside. He said his only complaint is that the food is not nearly as good as it was in Baltimore. If you've heard of Minnesota nice, there's also an expression that is Minnesota bland, and that's where everything is kind of looks the same and tastes the same. Seasoning, when I was growing up, was salt or pepper, and that was about it. But anyway, what I love about that story is that he was open to changing his mind and going in an entirely new direction. And I think that that is what God calls us to do as well. Jesus talks to start, is starting to talk about the Spirit now as we are approaching the day of Pentecost. And remember the gift of the Holy Spirit, and if there is one thing God's people are called to do is to be open to where the Spirit is leading us. And sometimes it leads us down roads that are well-worn and familiar, but there are other times it leads us down roads we have either never traveled before or never thought in a million years that we would end up on. And one of those roads, I think, is the road of love. And that is what Jesus talks about again in our gospel reading today. Jesus reminds us that if we are truly his disciples and want to truly follow him, we will be open to loving one another in the same way that God in Christ loves us. And that, too, is a very challenging and high calling. Because sometimes we are not so lovable and the people that we are called to be with are not so lovable either. And there are times that I think the only way that we can truly love one another is with the help of the Spirit. Because by ourselves, sometimes it's just 
a bridge too far. It's just too difficult to do. But of course, that is exactly what we are called to do as God's people. And not love in some mushy way that we read about in Hallmark cards, but the real work of love, which involves forgiveness, acceptance, extending grace and kindness when we don't feel like it, going the extra mile with someone who's having a difficult day or going through a difficult period. The kind of love that Jesus calls us to is sacrificial. It requires some commitment on our part. And I've often thought to be a disciple of Christ is not only something we undertake with our head and our mind, but also with our heart, because it changes all of us, and it will lead us in entirely new directions. Now, as I was listening to people talk about the terrible aftermath about the shooting in Baltimore, the one person that moved me the most was the grandson of someone who was killed in another shooting in South Carolina. In the book, Amazing Grace, it talks about that terrible episode where somebody walked into a Bible study at a church and then took the lives of nine people because their skin was the wrong color. And so this person whose grandmother, whose life was taken there, simply said, you know, as human beings, we just have to be better at loving one another. We have to be better at accepting who we are, at being God's children, and remember that we are all called to love each other. Now, there is a lot that can be said about that incident, but I found those words so powerful and so moving because that, I think, is the type of love that God in Christ calls us to. We are called to do the difficult work of loving people, and it is not always easy. But we remember that God in Christ loves us, and sometimes we have to admit that we are not always so lovable as well. But this love changes us and transforms us, sets us free, and sets us to go in entirely new directions. And that seems to be the calling of the Christian life, being open to new adventures, whether they are halfway around the world or in our own neighborhood. We are called to go where it is that God is leading us. And so today we recognize and celebrate some of our high school seniors who are about to say goodbye to Verona, temporarily of course, and to go off on adventures of their own. And I know that one of the questions that high school seniors are really tired of answering is that question, so, what are you doing next year? And I've often thought if someone were to ask the rest of us what we were doing next year, we wouldn't always know the answer to that. But of course, transition periods are always a bit challenging, and you're never certain of what the future will hold. I remember when I was graduating from high school, and I know that that was a long, long time ago, in a place far, far away, I happened to hang out with a number of people who seemed to know exactly what they were going to do. And that always bothered me. In fact, I thought about choosing entirely new friends, but it was just too much work. <laughs> but they knew that they were going to be a dentist or a doctor or a teacher or an engineer. And now, all these years later, most of these people are retiring as dentists and doctors and engineers and teachers. I, on the other hand, had no idea. But it is okay to not know. You simply embrace the question and embrace a bit of the uncertainty and then go forward in the adventure. But then, of course, there are times when you think you know, but you really don't. And that, of course, is always the challenge. As the old saying goes, it's not what we know that, or what we don't know that is the problem, is what we think we know that just isn't so. Which brings me to one of my friends, who was probably the most talented and intelligent of all of us. He was going to be a doctor, 
And it made sense because his dad was a doctor, his brother was in med school, he was always very smart, and so he went off to school to be a doctor. But then he went to one of these Lutheran colleges, of course, where all kinds of strange things happen, and he went on a semester abroad to Japan. And when he came back from Japan, he no longer wanted to be a doctor, he wanted to be a folk singer. Well, you can imagine the joy on his father and mother's face as he had that conversation with them. And of course, all these years later, he is not a doctor. He did some singing and recording and wandered off into other avenues, but it all worked out. And I think that is the thing that we have to remember most of all when we face times of uncertainty and times of transition in our life. As God's people, we are called to have a deep faith that even though we don't know where we're going all the time, we know that God in Christ is going with us. And that, of course, is the crucial and critical difference. The old African proverb that if you want to travel fast, go alone, but if you want to travel far, go together. And that is the part of the joy of the Christian community. We journey forth together not always knowing where we're going, but always knowing that God's love and God's grace is leading us, surrounding us, upholding us, and helping us get up and put one foot in front of the other. And so as God's people, we need to be open to new adventures. But as we are open to these new adventures, we always go forth in love. God's love for us and our love for one another. Amen. And now let us sing together. Well, no, let, um, as I was saying, <clears throat> this has been carefully rehearsed. Um, there is the St. James Vocal and Handbell Choir. It's a new adventure, what can I say?
Thank you, choirs. And now let us confess together our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He ascended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Let us continue with the prayers. Set free from captivity to sin and death, we pray to the God of resurrection for the church, people in need, and all of creation. God of new life, open your church to the unexpected ways your spirit is at work. Guide bishops, pastors, deacons, and lay teachers in their visioning, partnership, and planning. Surround us with your peace. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Give a vision to increase an abundant harvest for farmers, laborers, and gardeners who are beginning their growing season. Join their efforts with the goodness of creation to feed all living things. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Shine your light of wisdom and peace among nations when those in power seek to assert dominance over others, confound their ways, and make them yield to your humble authority. We pray for all those serving in the military, especially Wyatt, Evan, Brian, Judy, and Hannah, and we continue to pray for peace in Ukraine. God, in your mercy, give safe haven to those who seek healing, liberation, or peace, especially Mary, Bruce and Perline, Julie, Jennifer, Joanne, Judy, John, Tracy, Debbie, Ruben, Dustin, Monica, Susan, Sharon, and Dave. Create places filled with hospitality where hurting people find your loving presence and wholeness. God, in your mercy. Uphold the work of ministries and organizations in our community who assist people experience homelessness, citizens returning from prison, and all marginalized people. Accomplish your will through their efforts. God, in your mercy. Gracious God, surround those who are graduating with your grace. Bless them with hope so that they move forward in the future with eager and open hearts. Inspire them to believe in the goodness of life even when faced with challenges and difficulties. Guide them on their journey. Assure them, assure them always of your love and presence. God, in your mercy. In your mercy, O God, respond to these prayers and renew us by your life-giving spirit through Jesus Christ, our Savior.
Let us pray. Loving God, you gathered the wolf and the lamb to feed together. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, for the glorious resurrection of our Savior Jesus Christ, the true Paschal Lamb who gave himself to take away our sin, who in dying has destroyed death, and in rising has brought us to eternal life. And so with Mary Magdalene and Peter and all the witnesses of the resurrection, with earth and sea and all their creatures, with angels and archangels, cherubim and seraphim, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. And again after supper he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven,
And now receive the blessing. May the body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in His grace. Amen. Let us pray. We give you thanks, generous God, for in this bread and cup we have tasted the new heaven and earth, where hunger and thirst are no more. Send us from this table as witnesses to the resurrection, that through our lives all may know life in Jesus' name. God, the author of life, Christ, the living cornerstone, and the life-giving spirit of adoption, bless you now and forever. Amen. Well, a few announcements before we go on our way, but one is a reminder that you are invited to please join us, to be with our graduates, to honor and celebrate them, and to have some cake and coffee. And that, of course, will be in the dining room right after our service. A reminder that next weekend, with being Memorial Day, we then go into our summer schedule, and so there will not be two worship services, just one. And so the one worship service will be at 9 o'clock starting next Sunday morning. The donations are still being taken for diapers or monetary support as a part of our work with the Lutheran World Relief. And you can read more about that, and there is a place where you can <clears throat> uh, make your donations on the Welcome Center. There are other announcements that are printed in the bulletin. And now I invite you to please rise and as we sing our sending hymn. And before we do our send our, sing our sending hymn, I wanted to let you know that Kurt insisted and insisted for weeks that that laureate would be today. And I am sure the reason is, that is because there's cake. And it's also a special day. It is Kurt's birthday, so please join the choirs in singing happy birthday to Kurt. <laughs> Happy birthday to you.
Alleluia, Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Alleluia. Go in peace, tell what God has done. Thanks be to God.